Has your life been changed by Jesus? Now, that's an important question. Because there are a lot of folks that walk around saying, I'm a Christian, and yet there's no transformation that has occurred in their life. Years ago, I was doing some marriage counseling, and I was talking to them about their relationship with Christ because I believe that Jesus is the answer for happy, healthy marriages. And I was asking them about their relationship with the Lord, and the, the gentleman was very honest with me. He said, I'm, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a believer in Christ. The lady said, well, uh, she said, years ago, when I was 12, she was 40 at this time, she said, I went to a youth camp, a youth meeting, and I remember one night I got really, really emotional, and I just could not stop crying. And I said, well, tell me about your life since then, these last 28 years. Has there been a concern for the things with Jesus? Has there been a desire to live for Jesus and please Jesus? Has there been a focus in your life on Jesus And she said, very honestly, and I appreciated this, no, there really hasn't. See, she had an emotional experience with no transformation. And in our text this morning, we're going to see that if someone is truly born again, if someone is truly saved, if someone is truly justified... Moral transformation always follows. Or let me say it like this. No change, no Jesus. And that's the point that Paul is making at the end of chapter 2 in Galatians. So turn there with me. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 17 down through the end of the chapter. Galatians chapter 2, verse 17. I want to ask you this morning if you're physically able to please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. Paul writes, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name and we ask for your blessing upon this service. Father, would you move in our midst, touch our hearts, change our lives. Lord, I pray that the preaching of your word would be in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Holy Spirit of God, would you open the eyes of our hearts, give us understanding, give us comprehension, and then give us inclination to respond to what you teach us. Have your way in our midst. Help us to exalt the crucified and risen Lord Jesus in these moments. And we'll thank you and praise you for that grace. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. In this letter that Paul was writing to churches throughout the first century province, Roman province of Galatia, Paul is dealing with false teaching that had infiltrated the church concerning the gospel. And as Paul warns them of these distortions of the gospel, in verse 16 of chapter 2, he defines the gospel very, very clearly as to what the gospel is all about. And I told you last week that 
If you had to boil down the book of Galatians to one verse, you could boil it down to verse 16. Because in that one verse, Paul mentions justification three times. Now, justification is the act whereby God declares a sinner not guilty. It is a right standing with God. To be justified is to be right with God, which leads us to this question, how is a person made right with God? Well, back in verse 16, he says it three times. It's not by works of the law. No one will be justified through works of the law. In other words, God has his standards, God has his law, and we've all fallen short. We're sinners in need of a Savior. So no one is able to attain that standard perfectly. No one can live up to God's law. The law shows us that we've fallen short and we need a Savior. So you you can't... Uh, Be made right with God through obedience, through moral effort. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. And he says it three times. And then he says three times in that same verse, you're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus Christ left the splendor and glory of heaven. He took on human flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He lived a perfect, matchless, unstained life. And he went to the cross for you and for me. He died on the cross, taking our sin on himself and dying uh, in our place, taking the punishment that you and I deserve. The wrath of God that we deserve was poured out upon Christ who took it in our place. After he died on the cross, he was buried. And early on Sunday mornings, we just heard in song, he, he was raised from the dead. He's defeated death itself. He's alive today and he is mighty to save. And if any sinner sees their need for him and turns from their sin and repentance and places their faith in Christ and his finished work, they will be justified. Not based upon their merit, but based upon what Jesus Christ has done for them. And so we're justified, we're made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. He drives that point home in verse 16. Now in verse 17, Paul anticipates some objections to that doctrine. Look what he says there in verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? He's dealing with a common objection in the first century to justification by faith and a common objection in today's time to justification by faith. And here's what opponents were saying. Well, that sounds great, Paul. Place your faith in Christ, you're forgiven, and you go to heaven. Morality doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want to do, live however you want to live, and and you get this free pass to heaven. So, Paul, your doctrine is undermining morality. It's undermining God's standards. And so if you're teaching people this, and they think that Jesus saves them when they ignore the law, then you're making Jesus the author of sin. He's contributing to more and more people disregarding your law. So is Jesus the author of sin? And Paul says, certainly not. You've got it all wrong. And as as he continues through the end of this chapter, he explains to them that morality does matter. It doesn't save because no one is moral enough. But it does matter. And he shows us how morality matters in the rest of this passage. Now James Montgomery Boyce sums up the objections of folks that were... Uh, anti-justification by faith, this idea that you're undermining God's morals and standards. He writes, the argument would go, your doctrine of justification by faith is dangerous, for by eliminating the law, you also eliminate a man's sense of moral responsibility. If a person can be accounted righteous simply by believing that Christ died for him, why then should he bother to keep the law, or for that matter, why should he bother to live by any standard of morality? There is no need to be good. The result of your doctrine is that men will believe in Christ, but thereafter do as they desire. Is that the doctrine of justification by faith? Believe in Christ and then do whatever you want, do what you desire? Live it up because your sins are all forgiven? Is that how a Christian thinks? Can you have this encounter with Christ and then remain unchanged? Paul says no. And he shows us why at the end of chapter 2. So what I want to do is, I want to give you from the text two reasons why moral transformation follows justification. Two reasons why moral transformation follows justification. If you're truly saved, 
your life will be transformed by Christ. And we see this very clearly in this passage. So, reason number one, that moral transformation follows justification. You ready? The cross is precious. The cross is precious. To make his argument and to counter the objections of these false teachers, Paul highlights the cross. And he points us to the cross. And he speaks here of the preciousness of the cross. Now, why is the cross so precious to Christians? Well, first of all, the cross is precious because Christ died for us. Did you notice what it said there in verse 20? I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Speaking of Jesus dying on the cross for me. Now notice two things about this this death of Jesus on the cross. First of all, notice the motivation for his death. It says that he loved me. He loved me. The reason Jesus died for us is because he loves us. He went to the cross in obedience to the Father. He went to the cross to make a way for lost sinners to be reconciled to a holy God. He went to the cross to glorify the great name of our God. But listen to me. He went to the cross driven by his love for us. And perhaps you're here this morning and you think, how could God love me? I'm too far gone. I'm, I'm beyond that. My background, who I am. There, there's no way that God could love me. And the cross declares that you are loved. Because Jesus died in your place. The cross is the supreme declaration of the love of Jesus for us. He says, He loved me. That's why He gave Himself for me. So notice here the motivation for his death. But notice also the effect of his death. Look what it says in verse 20. He says there, who loved me, into that verse, and he gave himself for me. Now that word for is the Greek preposition huper. A, a, a good way to translate that is, he gave himself on behalf of me. That speaks of substitution. He died in my place. Paul's saying, I'm the one that deserved wrath. I'm the one that deserved punishment. But Jesus took all of my sin on himself and he died in my place on my behalf. The substitutionary atoning work of Christ. So that's the effect of his death. He died for our sins. He paid the penalty that we could not pay so our sins could be forgiven. And so the cross is precious because Christ died for us. But let me give you another reason in this text for the preciousness of the cross. The cross is precious because we died with Christ. Not only did Christ die for us, we died with Christ. Look what he says there in verse 19. He says, or verse 18, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Here's what Paul's saying. Christ is not the author of sin. Justification does not lead to living however you want to live. We'll talk about that in just a moment. If you really want to talk about a scandal, verse 18, a scandal would be if I tried to rebuild the law and say you're saved by keeping it when I know better. I know you can't be saved by keeping the law. So then I would be a transgressor if I tried to go back to the law when I've met Jesus and been saved by faith through his grace. That would be a scandal. Then I would be a transgressor. But look what he says next about his relationship with the law. For through the law... I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have, here it is, I have been crucified with Christ. That word with, that preposition speaks of our union with Christ. When you were saved, you were united with Christ. You entered into a union with Christ. This means that things that were true of Jesus and are true of Jesus become true of us. In other words, just like Jesus died on the cross, we died too. We were crucified too. That's what he says in verse 19. Through the law, I died to the law. I've been crucified with the cross. What does it mean to die to the law? What does that phrase mean? Paul's saying that 
I died to a life of moral effort, which brings hopelessness. If you're trying to save yourself, you are living a hopeless life because you never know if you've done enough. You never know if you measure up. You never know if you meet the standard. And Paul said, I used to live that kind of life. I thought that my external righteousness, my conformity to God's law, saved me. And I was living uh, passionately trying to keep the law, but I've died to that. I know the law can't save you. I know that I'm imperfect. and I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And so I've died to the law. I've died to moral effort. I've died to hopelessness. What Paul is speaking of here is not disregard for the law. We, we talked about the law being the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law, which are summed up in the Ten Commandments. He's not saying that the law is bad. He's not disregarding the law. He's just denying that the law can save. He said, I died to the idea that I could earn my salvation. That, that's what I died to. Romans mentions this crucifixion that happens when we meet Christ. Over in Romans 6 it says that when we meet Jesus, it's as if we are crucified too. And we're crucified to our old sin nature so that the law no longer has, or our sin no longer has dominion over us. We're set free. We're forgiven. We're set free when we are united with Christ. And so when you were saved at the moment of salvation, you entered into a union with Christ And just like Jesus died on the cross, you died. Your old self died. Which leads to this. Our death to living under the hopelessness of the law makes a way for our resurrection. Look what he says in verse 19. Through the law I died to the law so that I might live. I died. My old self died. My old beliefs died. My old... Uh, adherence to thinking I could save myself. It died so that I might live to God. Verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live. So I've been crucified, but I'm still living. That speaks of a resurrection. Romans 6 says, same idea, being united with Christ, says that, that in Christ we are raised to walk in newness of life. The old self dies, the The power of sin over our life dies and we're raised to walk in newness of life. We become a brand new person. So just like Jesus died on the cross, our old self died too. It was crucified. And just like Jesus rose from the dead, we rose too. A brand new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You're hearing this morning from a new Wade. Because the old Wade's dead. He was crucified when I met Jesus. And that's what Paul is talking about here. The old self died and that makes way for a resurrection. So the new self could live. Lawrence Richards writes this. In God's sight, the believer is so linked with Jesus... That his death, his death is considered ours. Even more, we are united with Jesus in his resurrection and so have access to God's own power for holy living. So Paul's saying, let me tell you this. You can't meet Jesus and stay the same. Because when you meet Jesus, a death and a resurrection occur. How can you stay the same if that's happened to you, right? That's the point that Paul's making. And so the cross is precious not only because Jesus died for us on the cross and not only because we died with Jesus, we were crucified with him in union, but third, the cross is precious because there's no other way to be saved. Look at what it says in verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. It's a powerful verse. Paul's saying, If if there are other ways to be saved, if there are other ways to be made right with God, if you can save yourself through your moral effort, then Christ died for no reason. And our God is not random. He would not send his son to die at Calvary for no reason. The reason that God the Father sent God the Son and poured out his wrath upon Jesus when he died in our place on the cross is because that's the only way you and I could be justified. So he's saying, put away all this idea of 
of moral effort saving you. You're not good enough. If you could save yourself, that makes the cross meaningless. And we know that's not true. So he speaks here of the preciousness of the cross. No, our, our logo, our little icon in our logo, the point, has the cross right in the middle. And that's by design. Because you and I need to remember that we're not just a religious organization doing spiritual things. We are who we are because of the cross. We are justified because of the cross. We've been transformed because of the cross. The old self has died and we've been made brand new because of the cross. And so Paul's point is this. If you've been saved, if you've been justified, how can you have all of this occur in your life and not be changed? Which leads to Another truth, another reason that moral transformation follows justification. Not only is the cross cross precious, but the indwelling Christ is powerful. The indwelling Christ is powerful. After highlighting the objective realities of the cross, Paul explains the subjective experience of the indwelling of Christ. And here's what Paul wants you and I to understand. Christianity, listen to me, is not just a way to heaven. It is a way of life. Look what he says in verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So he's saying, I'm still living as a resurrected new creation in Christ. And this life matters. And I believe if there's anything maybe the church today needs to emphasize more. Is that justification is not just a get out of hell free card. It's not... It's not a doctrine that says, hey, place your faith in Christ, your sins are forgiven, now go live however you want to live. Justification sets the stage for your moral transformation. Christianity is not just a way to heaven. Now, it is a way to heaven. I'm so grateful that because of Jesus, because of his shed blood, my sins are forgiven. I don't have to go to hell. I get to go to heaven. That's good news, right? But Christianity is more than that. God is concerned with with what's happening in your life right now. He's not only concerned with us celebrating the gospel on Sunday, He's concerned about your Monday. Christianity is not just a way to heaven, it's a way of life. That's the point that He's making here. God is not concerned with with your eternity, or God is concerned with your eternity and your morality. God is concerned with your position and your practice. God is concerned with your justification and your transformation. Now, how does that happen? How does God bring that about in our life? At the moment of conversion, listen, Jesus comes to live in us. Now, look what he says in verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. The old me is dead. But Christ who lives within me. And the life I now live. I've been resurrected. I'm a new creation. The life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice that phrase. Christ lives in me. When I was justified by grace through faith. At that moment of conversion. The moment I was born again. Jesus. Listen to this. Some of you aren't hearing me. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the Lion, and the Lamb, when you were saved, He came to live on the inside of you. Think about that. Jesus indwelling you. Wow. Which leads to the obvious question. How can Jesus come to live on the inside of you and there be no change? It's it's just not logical. It's just not possible. If Jesus comes to live in you, there will be a change. 
Adrian Rogers says, I am the visible part of the invisible Christ. He is the invisible part of the visible me. He lives in me. So what does that look like? How should that affect your Monday? If, If Jesus lives in you as a believer in him, how should that affect your day at school tomorrow or your day on the job or in your home? How, how should that affect you? What, is that, what are the implications of Jesus living in you? Here it is. We are to trust daily in the transforming power of Christ. He says in verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God. Faith is not just believing in Jesus and trusting in Him so you can be saved. It should be a daily reality in our lives. Daily trusting Him after we're justified for transformation or sanctification. It's what faith is all about in in our lives. Faith in the indwelling Christ. And this means at least two things. Number one... This means that we live with an acute awareness of His presence. And maybe you're here this morning and you're a believer. And the Lord made sure on this rainy day that you were in church. So you could be reminded that Jesus lives in you and that ought to matter. We should live with an acute awareness of His presence. As we go our separate directions today and and, and tomorrow and during the week, if we are born again, if we've been justified, we need to understand Jesus lives in us. Wherever you go tomorrow, Jesus goes too, right? He lives in you. I believe that living by faith in the indwelling Christ means we have an acute awareness of this. This is at the forefront of our mind and heart. That we know transformation is is, is available and, and, and potential and possible because he lives in us. Secondly, this living by faith in the Son of God means that we are to submit daily to his work. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. This means that daily we should submit to his work in our lives. I think there are a couple of verses that kind of highlight what needs to happen in our lives for this to be a reality. One of them is a well-known verse over in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, where Jesus said, says, If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, watch this, take up his cross daily. Everyone say daily. Daily, daily and follow me. That means if you want Jesus to have his way in your life, you've got to die daily. You got to lay down your agenda and your plans for him. And say Jesus today is your day. Live through me. Bear fruit through my life. Change me today. Lead me today. Guide me today. I don't want this day, to, to, this day to be about me. It's about you. A daily dying to self. There's another verse found over in John chapter 3. The context is the preaching ministry of John the Baptist. He's the forerunner for Christ. He's saying... The Christ is coming, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when Jesus comes on the scene and begins his public ministry, some of John's disciples begin to notice that a lot of the folks that were listening to John preach are now listening to Jesus preach. And his crowd, John the Baptist's crowd, is getting smaller and Jesus' crowd is getting bigger. They come to John and say, John... Not as many people are reading your blog posts. Your crusade numbers are down. I mean, should we be concerned about this? I mean, you're pretty important too, John. You know what John says in John 3.30? Oh, I love it. He says, He must increase and I must decrease. 
And if you want to live daily by faith in the Son of God who indwells you, you've got to make a daily decision. Today I want to decrease and I want Jesus to increase. That's what it means to live by faith in the indwelling Son of God. The ESV Study Bible says this about verse 20. Paul seems to be saying that as he trusts Christ moment by moment, Christ then works in and through Paul to give spiritual effectiveness to all that he does. What's that verse all about? Listen to me. Do you want Christ to work in and through you tomorrow? To give you spiritual effectiveness? You've got to die to self. You've got to decrease Surrender to Jesus so he will increase in your life and live through you. And I promise you, Jesus will do a better job living through you than you can do living in your own strength. That's the point. We're to trust daily in the transforming power of Christ. Now listen, justification by faith is not a lowering of standards. After you're saved by grace through faith, then the Lord comes to live on the inside of you to help you to begin to live up to those standards. So wait, I thought those standards were gone. We don't have to worry about the law anymore. Well, the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, which unveils His character and nature, they're repeated in the New Testament. So they're meant for us today to live up to the Ten Commandments. So how does that work when it comes to justification? Well, if you remember last week, I shared an illustration with you about about justification by faith. And I said, if you went to a gym, you wanted to join the gym to get in shape. And the owner of the gym said, well, if you want to join this gym, you got to come over to this bench, and you've got to bench press 500 pounds. You and I would say, we can't do it, we're too weak. And that's an illustration of why the law won't save us. The law is good, the Bible says. It's righteous and good. It unveils the character and nature of God. But because of our sin nature, we're too weak to keep it. So it cannot save. And you have to say to the owner of the gym, I can't bench press 500 pounds. Guess I can't join your gym. And I told you last week, your only hope would be that the gym owner, as an act of grace, would say, here's your membership, right? You remember the gym. But what about the 500 pounds? It'd be good to be able to get 500 pounds up, wouldn't it? That'd be good. What about the Ten Commandments? I mean, do those matter? Should we try to live up to the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God? Yes, they're in the New Testament. Obviously, we should. What about that? Well, here's, here, here's, what, here's what Jesus does. It's like the owner of the gym giving you a gym membership and then saying, Hey, come over with me to the bench press. You come over to the bench press. He said, hey, lay down and get ready to bench this 500 pounds. You say, I can't do it. And then out, out walks from uh, behind the, 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 the corner there an Olympic power lifter. And the, the owner of the gym says, this Olympic power lifter is going to get under the weight with you. I know you can't do it. You're too weak. But with his strength, you'll get the weight up. And then he helps you. And you can go home and say, I bench pressed 500 pounds today. Why? You couldn't do it, but you had strength to help you to do it. Amen? That's what he's saying here. You can't keep the law. You've fallen short. You deserve punishment. But if you'll place your faith in Christ, you'll be forgiven. You'll be justified. You'll be made right with God. And then, at the moment of conversion, Jesus himself will come live inside of you and give you the strength to live up to the law you could not keep. He'll change you. Moral transformation. And in an ongoing way, as you experience the sanctifying work of Jesus, you will see a change. That's why I said earlier, no change, no Jesus. Because if Jesus lives inside of you, something has to change. So, what's Paul's point here? This is the, this is the point I want you to walk away with. And I believe this summarizes the argument at the end of chapter 2. If I have embraced the cross, the old me's dead, I'm raised to walk in newness of life. 
If I've embraced the cross, and if Jesus lives in me, I cannot stay the same. Do you see it? If you've embraced the cross and Jesus indwells you, moral transformation is sure to follow. I like this quote from John Stott. Speaking again of the objectors to the doctrine of justification by faith, he writes, Their charge that justification by faith encouraged a continuance in sin was ludicrous. They grossly misunderstood the gospel of justification. Justification is not a legal fiction in which a man's status is changed while his character is left untouched. Yes, you're declared righteous by faith in Christ through a gift of God's grace. But when you are saved, God will then go after your transformation. He'll go after your character. He'll change you from the inside out. You cannot stay the same. And that's the point of this passage. And so my question is, have you been changed by Jesus? Jesus.